Hello and welcome to the fourth Macker to Macker. We've been having a great time doing these programmes and if this is your first time along then a very special welcome to you. Macker, the word Macker is the word for Scottish national poet and at the moment that's me. I'm the third modern Macker. I followed Edwin Morgan and Liz Lockhead. Edwin Morgan, had he lived, would have been 100 this year. It's his centenary. So I'm the third modern macker, but the term macker has been kicking around for a long, long time. In fact, Chaucer was referred to as a macker by Dunbar. And the nearest English equivalent of macker is maker. So the idea of this series is that we pass the baton on macker to macker, maker to maker, from episode to episode and within the own programme. These programmes, we hope, are a rich mix, a rich and heady mix of poetry and song. I always used to be happiest as a wee girl when I was sat in my living room and we had these party socials in my own house and we listened to people singing. Anna Ashton would sing John Anderson, my Joe John, and I used to watch her singing, fascinated, because uh, she had a very wrinkly face and sometimes she'd cry when she sang the song and I've watched to see how long the wee tear that got stuck in the wrinkle would take before it dropped down her face. But anyway, I was always happiest listening to song. And tonight we've got a wonderful singer on, Suzanne Bonner, and we've got a wonderful poet for you, Imtiaz Darker, and I'm going to introduce them properly in a minute. But each of these programmes, I kick off with a wee poem, uh, we being weird than we, Toti in this case, Toti being weird than we, a wee poem of my own, and this one's called In the Poem. And this was inspired by the great blues singer, Bessie Smith, uh, who had to, as she was going around the South in the 1920s, a hundred years ago, um, taken the terrible views of lynchings, so many of them. And there was so much racism then that she got her own train, her own Pullman train, to try and avoid the, the segregated trains. And so her train coming into town was always a big event that Bessie's train would, would pull into town, her own special Pullman. It was a distinctive yellow in the Pullman. Bessie and I are in her Pullman heading for Tennessee. Bessie and I are in her Pullman heading for Tennessee. We've got so much heartbreak, we can't divide it easily. I take one piece, she takes another. We both drive and our sadness drives further. It's way up ahead, ahead of Bessie and me. And even in the springtime, it's hanging from the pawpaw tree. The road is long and flat. The fields are repeating the cotton. The road is so long and flat. Life is like that. We drive without moving. We try and carry on, but there's this big sadness hanging from the pawpaw tree. It's way up ahead, ahead of Bessie and me. I want to now introduce to you the really, really wonderful Suzanne Bonner. Hey! There she is. <laughs> there she is. There's my girl. <laughs> it's, uh, it's great to see you, Suzanne. And Suzanne um, is just a, a fantastic singer. She's got one of these amazing voices that you're absolutely going to love. She first broke onto the scene there. I first came across her in the extraordinary and wittily titled 1991 documentary, Fly Me to Dunoon. And then she made another documentary quite a few years later about tracing her birth father that she hadn't seen since she was two. And that won all sorts of awards, a Celtic Award, a New York Times Award, all sorts of awards. She sang at jazz festivals all over. Um, she's got a huge, big, generous personality. <laughs> she's a very close family friend um, of ours. And you know, when the, the last time that I actually heard her sing live was at my dad's funeral, where she would have been the last voice if my dad could have still heard inside. Uh, if he could have still heard, it would have been your voice that, that he heard, Suzanne. Um, yeah, welcome. Oh, thank you, my bonnie lassie. <laughs> my bonnie macker. <laughs> and what song have you picked for us uh, this week? The first to, to song I've off with, yes. 
The first one is, um, it's an old Ray Charles and Solomon Burke, an old um, blues song, um, and it's called None of Us Are Free. Well, that's fantastic. And in the room with us in this wonderful Zoom room with that beautiful looking purple couch um, behind her and looking very <laughs> sophisticated and suave is the absolutely fantastic MTS Darker. Um, we're all, <laughs> hi MTS, we're all kind of Glasgow, we're all Glasgow girls um, and we're all black Scottish Glasgow girls, which is, which is fantastic, you know, <laughs> so never mind the Glasgow boys, let's, let's, let's big it up for the Glasgow girls. <laughs> I'm going to be introducing MTS properly. Uh, in a moment or two after we hear your first song. Take it away, Suzanne. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you had better listen, my sisters and brothers. If you listen, you can hear the voices calling throughout the years. And they are calling all over the ocean. They are calling all over the land. And they're crying to get the message out to you. None of us are free. None of us are free. If one of us is chained, none of us are free. And there are people still in darkness and they just can't see the light. And if we don't say it's wrong, they'll think it's right. You gotta feel to help each other, help out your brothers and sisters to get the message and sing it out loud. None of us are free. None of us are free. If one of us is chained, none of us are free. None of us are free. None of us are free. If one of us is chained, then none of us are free. Woo -hoo -hoo. And it don't take much to reach your salvation. But no one can do it for free. We've got to reach the heart of humanity. So every soul who suffers like George Floyd will know we are with him. Yeah. Woo! None of us are free. Hey, none of us are free. If one of us is chained, whoa, whoa none of us are free. Well, 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 none of us, 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 none of us. If we can't breathe, we aren't free. No, 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 one of us, none of us, one of us, none of us, yeah. If we can't breathe, if we are chained, None of us are free. Thank you. Wow, Suzanne, that was that was extraordinary. And um, well, thank you so much for for also changing those lyrics and and for being in this moment, this really, really hard moment to live through. We're in a we feel like we're in a repeat cycle um, at the moment, and it has tested and frayed the nerves of, of black people 
the world over. Was that some of your reason for picking that song um, now? Was the, the recent and terrible tragic death of George Floyd? It certainly was. And, um, you know, for me to watch, I'm a nurse too, so to watch the footage, I found it very hard to watch the footage of, of someone saying that I can't breathe. You know, we have three minutes, oxygen, breath is life. And for to hear that, I can't breathe. And then someone else to say, you need to check his pulse. You know, he seems unresponsive, just horrendous. And to see that a knee was still placed on his neck, I, um, I just, I find it unbearable, unbearable. And do you, did you find when you were singing that song, because I mean, I'm sure Imtiaz and I both find it very, emotional but did you find that when you were singing that song that the release that goes into singing a song makes you feel that you're contributing something yes and i think that does come from the heritage i think was on my my dad's side the the gospel my grandfather was a preacher got his calling to preach from the trees and there is a collective consciousness and that's a beautiful thing about mtas and yourself your work you know you carry that consciousness through that's it, definitely. That's a lovely thing to say, Suzanne, and, and thank you for that. Um, Imtiaz, how did you find that song? What did you feel about it? I felt as if I needed to hear that song now. You know, every day I wake up with this kind of growing rage every time I listen to the news at the kind of terrible continuing injustice. But listening to this song, it makes me feel as if you can take the rage, as if the song can take the rage, the impotence of the rage, and turn it into something more powerful, something better. Yeah, so I think that's beautifully, beautifully put, Imtiaz. I mean, this, this, we have to take so much and we have to bear so much. And racism is, it, you know, it goes on the world over. We've all experienced racism in our in our various different different ways, and there's something thunderously distressing um, and harrowing about it, particularly police brutality, but all different forms of racism is very, 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 very harrowing. But also there's something really heartening about the fact that there's been so much protest because where there is revolt, there is surely hope. And Suzanne, I was just really interested in the, when you went to find your, your father or to re-meet re him again, and you got to his church, and did you have an experience of singing in that church? What was it, what was that like for you? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I remember walking through the door and even all the camera crew saying, if church was like this, we would be here every week. <laughs> and just thunderous, you know, the floor, like you could just hear all the floor and clapping and singing. And I was actually quite scared. I thought, God, I've got to go up and sing, you know, in front of these people that have that innate. But it was really interesting when I got up to sing that they recognised something in me too. So I was at home in a lot of ways, which was lovely. So all my fears, you know, entering into it, because I'm Scottish, you know, I've been brought up in Scotland. So all my fears of entering into that culture and wanting to be authentic, you know, not wanting to cheat in any way. So it was really nice that they welcomed me and, and recognised. And they were saying, where did you learn to, where did you learn to sing like that? <laughs> <laughs> But do you, feel half, do you feel half American as well? Or do you feel mainly black and Scottish? Do, do, is some of your identity rooted in America? Or, or yes, yes, is, definitely, definitely, yes, yes. Because it's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, this, this is going to lead me on very, very nicely to introducing Imtiaz to you um, properly, or as properly as I can, I can manage. Um, Imtiaz Darker is a really wonderfully multi-talented writer. She's, she's a poet and she illustrates her own books. Her books are actually works of art, you know, and they're, they're, they're so lovely to, to read and to contemplate the way that the image works with the poem. She also makes films. Her poems really explore lots of notions of identity. Imtiaz grew up in a Lahori household, what she describes as a Muslim Calvinist household in Glasgow. And then she was adopted by India and she married into Wales. The issues of transition, exile, identity, that question that we all ask ourselves the world over of where do you belong, runs through her work in a playful, humorous, profound and serious way. She's an extraordinary poet. She's a poet that Caroline Duffy, the previous poet laureate, said that if there was to be a world 
laureate, the only candidate, would be Imtiaz Darker. So I would like to really welcome Imtiaz Darker to Macker to Macker properly. Welcome, Imtiaz. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. It's great to be here. Good to see you again. It's lovely to see you again. And, um, and it would be really lovely if you can just kick us off with what we, what we like to call your first set. Yes. Because that makes us feel kind of vaguely musical, doesn't it? When we when we talk about poems as sets <laughs> and readings as gigs. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away, MGS. Right. Well, I start with one that I wrote a long time ago, but unfortunately, I think its time has come round again. And it's called "They Say She Must Be from Another Country." When I can't comprehend why they're burning books or closing borders, when they can't bear to look at God's own nakedness when they banned the film and got the seats to stop the play, and I ask why. They just smile and say, she must be from another country. When I speak on the phone and the vowel sounds are off, when the consonants are hard and they should be soft, they'll catch on at once, they'll pin it down, they'll explain it right away to their own satisfaction. They'll cluck their tongues and say, she must be from another country. When my mouth goes up instead of down, when I wear a tablecloth to go to town, when they suspect I'm black or think I'm gay, they won't be surprised. They'll purse their lips and say, she must be from another country. Maybe there is a country where all of us live, all of us freaks who aren't able to give our loyalty to pompous fools, the crooks and thugs who wear the uniform that gives them the right to wave a flag, puff out their chests, put their feet on our necks, and break their own rules. But from where we are, it doesn't look like a country. It's more like the cracks that go between borders behind their backs. That's where I live. And I'll be happy to say, I never learned their customs. I don't remember their language or know their ways. I must be from another country. And from there, I go straight on to one that Jackie has requested. So this is a, a special request from Jackie. Uh, I wrote this poem because sometimes you hear a phrase again and again, and it makes a kind of a rhythm that sticks in your head. That's what happened to me when I heard the same phrase on television and in news reports. And it's something that seems to have stuck in the throat of the English language, wherever it's spoken in the world. And the first part of this poem is actually made up of things that people have said, just rearranged a little. And it starts with football and ends, you'll see where. Speech balloon. The Barnsley manager was lost for words to describe his feelings when Chelsea fell to the tykes. We played fantastic. I never thought we'd do it again, but we did, we did. And all I can say is, I'm over the moon, they said, he said. I'm over the moon, he said. Bollywood's hottest couple was proud to be blessed by the jubilant father, the superstar. It's a match made in heaven, he said to the press, between two shooting stars with shining careers. And I'm over the moon, of course, he said. I'm over the moon, he said. The Malaysian nation went mad with joy on Independence Day in its 50th year when a doctor come part-time model, a local boy, went up into space in a Russian Soyuz and in zero gravity performed his namaz. All of Malaysia over the moon, they said on the news, 27 million people over the moon. You must have noticed. It's really quite clear. This condition has spread. It's happening there. It's happening here. It's full blown, grown beyond every border to the furthest corner of every country where English is spoken or English is known. There's no one just satisfied or mildly pleased or chipper or chirpy, contented or cheerful. No one glad or gratified, delighted or jubilant, elated, ecstatic, joyful or gleeful. All the happy people have left this world. You won't come across them anytime soon. And if it's happy sound bites you're looking for, you need to look way over your head for the words and balloons to the place where the cow keeps jumping over and over with all the footballers 
team managers and lottery winners, world superstars, heroes and champions and legends and lovers and proud mums and dads and the whole of Malaysia over the moon, over the moon, over the, over the, over the moon. So that was just for you, Jackie. Oh, I grew up in Glasgow, as Jackie said, and at all the time that I was growing up, I was sure that real life was going on somewhere else, in some other country, somewhere where I was not. And when I met my husband, Simon, uh, he said he felt exactly the same growing up in Wales. No reflection on Glasgow or Wales, it's just being young. So this one's called In Wales, Wanting to be Italian. And for those of you who know German, please excuse my imaginary German. Is there a name for that thing you do when you're young? There must be a word for it in some language, probably German. Or if not, it's just asking to be made up. Something like Fremdlandisch gehören Lust. Or perhaps Ein Soman des Land gehören Wunsch. What is it called? Living in Glasgow, dying to be French, dying to shrug and pout and make yourself understood without saying a word. Have you ever felt like that? Being in Bombay, wanting to declare, like Freddie Mercury, that you are from somewhere like Zanzibar? What is that called? Being 16 in Wales, longing to be Italian. To be able to say aloud without embarrassment, Bella, Bella. Lounge by a Vespa with a cigarette hanging out of your mouth and wear impossibly pointed shoes. I was thinking a lot about belonging, where, where we all belong. And so I read you two recent poems that kind of hang together. Where you belong. You can squat in this room if you don't say a word. You can stay in this town if you pay for a room. You can go on this train if it's off peak. You can speak your mind if you change your look. You can have your chance if you don't expect luck. You can be in the group if you get enough likes. You can live with family if you toe the line. You can keep your children if you count a sign. You can enter this church if you quote the book. You can open the book if you close your mind. You can save our time if you follow the rules. You can play a role if you buy the mask. You can take on the task if no one else wants it. You can ask the question if you never offend. You can belong, but only if you don't stay too long. You can end it now or start over again. You can follow the signs but never turn back. You can see you've run out of breath and years. You can leave in tears or you can go with a laugh. You can take your clothes but leave your shoes and that attitude behind. It does you no favours and you can do us a favour. Don't change your mind. Back. When the person holding your passport says, you'll have to go back where you came from, your mind takes you to Jamaica Bridge and the river Clyde flowing under your feet, away to sea where the ships once sailed. And when the woman in the queue mutters, this is not where you belong, you think of the way the light plays hide and seek over the hills on the Sunday morning ride up to the Campsy Fells. And when the man outside the pub looks up and says, go back to your country, you know you could trump the stota like a piece of pish if you could be bothered with go back to your cave and shut your gob, you scabby wallopper. That's when your heart goes home and you coory down, all of Glasgow shining in your window. And you remember this is where you came from the place that will always have your back. And I'll end this section with uh, 
one about my father uh, growing up in Glasgow. He, he um, I, I, I loved watching him because he was always so proud of um, understanding the local habits and customs, but he was especially proud of speaking the language like a local. So this is called Jodri Sher Mubarak looks at the loch. Light shakes out the dish rag sky and scatters the water with sequins. Look, hen, says my father, loch lomond, as if it were all his doing, as if he owned it. Laird of Lomond, Laird of the language. He's proud to say hen and even more loch with an och, not an och, to speak proper Glaswegian like a true born Scot. And he makes the right sound at the back of the throat because he can say hush and hwab and chamosh because the sounds for happy and dream are the words that swim in the water for him. So he says it again. Hen, look, the loch. Thank you. Oh, that was fantastic, Imtiaz. And you've given all of us such a lot to think about. I find that that last poem so tender and so true, the way that people try desperately to fit in through using language, even language that is both simultaneously familiar and unfamiliar to your tongue. I love the way that that poem explores these, these different sounds, the sounds that are already in your, in your dad's mouth and the sounds that are, are new to them. Thank you. I was just wondering, because you grew up in Glasgow yourself, and what your experience was of growing up in Glasgow, which, which part of the city was it, and, and what are your memories of, of Glasgow? I love the line there where you said, that the city will always have your back, and the kind of rich complexity that there is in feeling that you belong to Glasgow, I belong to Glasgow, but does Glasgow belong to me? I mean, there's, there's, that, there's that thing that you have to ask yourself all the time if you're a black, Scottish person or Black Glaswegian, um, because you will often be asked where you're from. It wouldn't be assumed that you're from Glasgow, um, even when you've lived there for years. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting um, paradoxical relationship that we have to belonging, don't you think? Yes, absolutely. Now, I, I have to say that my heart does a somersault every time I come in to Glasgow Central Station. And I always want to go to the house that I grew up in, where the family lived for about 40 years, even though I wasn't there for a lot of the, some of that time. And, you know, because that's where I'd watch my mother growing her roses in the garden and planting her potatoes. And Glasgow's also the place where, you know, at, in the cafe round, round the corner and further down the road, there'd be... Uh, the Italian cafe where the, the boys would play music on the jukebox and they looked so sophisticated to me. I mean, that was all of life was out there and down there. And there was that life going on that I really wanted. And I mean, of course, it was complex. I mean, there were moments which were beautiful and great and there were so many great people and there was also name calling on the streets always, of course. But Glasgow, the thing about it is you had to give it back as good as as good as you got. You had to be quick with the with the answer as well. And if you were quick enough, you could save your skin in Glasgow. <laughs> well, I like the piece in that in that poem where you kind of have this this stream of invective going going right back. And and it is something that you have to learn um, to to stand up for yourself. And it's something that people have been discussing a lot um, recently. That if you're the mum of a child, you know how do you how do you get your child to be tough enough to come, um, you know, to deal with racism? I heard a mother on Women's Hour the other day um, saying that she was trying, trying to shield her child from, from racism. But unfortunately, racism didn't wait for her child to grow up. And yeah. I found that an extraordinarily moving way, way to put it, that as children, we can have very, very early experiences of being different um, 
to, to other people and yet not within our family necessarily. Um, so what, did, did you feel that there was a great contrast between your family and the outside world or what was that like for you as a wee girl? Well, yes, I mean, that's the thing. Inside the house would be one country and outside the house was another. And you'd cross over out of the front door and you'd find all of these, these two different uh, places kind of overlapping on each other. And sometimes it'd be confusing because uh, the, the languages would slide over. Um, but it was also, I mean, I, I find that that's, it was a useful thing as well because you could enjoy the slide. You know, the, the music of one language, the sound of one language kind of melted into the other. And I see a big uh, uh, a kind of uh, similarity between Glaswegian and Punjabi, for example, because they're both big, bony, strong languages. <laughs> they're really tough languages. And I like that toughness. I like the strength of it. And I think that's, I mean, even the, the sliding over is what poetry does as well. And I think I had early, early experience of it, as we many of us do. Yeah, I like how you describe it as sliding over. And in a way, your work merges different cultures, different languages and, and, and ideas of self, notions of self. I mean, I love, I love those impossibly pointed shoes uh, in, the, in the end of the poem in Wales wanting to be Italian. And I love that, that vision um, of, of actually embracing being different, of being able to say, you know, I'm from Zanzibar or I'm from Haiti. I used to kind of experiment with that too. And I hadn't remembered that I used to do that until I heard that poem. It's really strange how sometimes hearing a poem can take you right back and you can think, I, oh, I, I remember doing that. So when people were saying to me, where are you from? Where are you from? Sometimes I would just turn it right around and go, Zanzibar. I'm from Zanzibar. <laughs> and, and that was cool. That would feel quite strong to be able to suddenly, yes. to suddenly, but I'd forgotten that till I heard that poem. And do you find that the business of writing poems makes you remember things you thought you'd forgotten? Yes, of course. You know, you, uh, you bury things. And also, there are things you decide to forget because you take your own stories with you as you go along. And there are things that you decide, okay, I'm going to remember this and not remember that. You know, you tend to put away the the experiences that didn't fit in with your idea of yourself and very often writing the poem just brings that back up and also it makes you research it makes you go back and ask the questions that I found myself asking questions that I never asked as a child there were things that my parents didn't speak about things that I'd never even thought of asking them and only what kind of what kind of things did they not speak about well about partition in India the partition of India and Pakistan. There were horrors that must, they must have seen, things that must have happened. And they never ever spoke about that to the children. It was only much later that you go back and start digging up what was it that they were doing, how did they come, why did they, you know, even why did they come here? You know, all of those things. Uh, and in fact, I hadn't really looked a lot at what my parents were doing, unlike you, because you, your parents spoke to you a lot, didn't they? they yeah, they did, they did. Your stories were part of your family life around the table. Mine wasn't. Um, and it's only, in fact, when I was uh, thinking about what my fa how my father and mother actually felt being here that I began to write the whole set of poems about my parents in Glasgow and, uh, and like the one about my father. Uh, it hadn't occurred to me before that he he was he was experimenting with language as well. Yes, it's extraordinary. I mean, you you, you recreate him so beautifully and so tenderly in in these poems. And the, the next poem that you're going to read continues in a sense, or is it a tangent to that that theme of of living space? And uh, so I wonder, Imtiaz, if you could give us another couple of poems, please. Well, uh, Bombay um, is a place that looks as if it's kind of held up with sellotape and string and scaffolding and uh, that began to look to me like an image of the whole world a kind of fragile place about to collapse just on the verge living space there are just not enough straight lines that is the problem nothing is flat or parallel beams balance crookedly on supports thrust off the vertical nails clutch at open seams 
the whole structure leans dangerously towards the miraculous. Into this rough frame, someone has squeezed a living space and even dared to place these eggs in a wire basket. Fragile curves of white hung out over the dark edge of a slanted universe, gathering the light into themselves as if they were the bright, thin walls of faith. And a poem that belongs in the same sequence, One Breath. All it would take is one slammed door to make the whole thing fall. One bottle hurled against a wall to start the hammering on the heart and crack the body's shell. One sneeze, one cough, one doubt. All it would take is one breath, no more. And I'll end this set with a poem called The Trick. In a wasted time, it's only when I sleep that all my senses come awake. In the wake of you, let day not break. Let me keep the scent, the weight, the bright of you. Take the countless hours and count them all night through till that time comes when you come to the door of dreams, carrying oranges that cast a glow up into your face. Greedy for more, greedy for more than the gift of seeing you, I lean in to taste the color, kiss it off your offered mouth. For this, for this, I fall asleep in haste willing to fall for the trick that tells the truth, that even your shade makes darkest absence bright, that shadows live wherever there is light. Wow, oh, MTS, that's just, just so moving, um, that last poem in particular. And I know that that's it's a very beautiful sonnet and that you wrote that poem as a response to one of Shakespeare's sonnets. And, and I wrote a sonnet myself in response to a Shakespeare sonnet. So I thought I'd read this one um, in response, kind of macker to macker to you. Um, this is called 35 and 35 is the number of the ward that my mum was in. Uh, in the royal at this, at this time. As quick as you fell ill, quickly you returned. A quip thrown back, a memory uncovered. Saline drip, subcut, a journey under cover. You slip into the railed bed, slide under. Outside Glasgow Royal, snow, a thin sheet. Inside, your wit, wisdom, make my heart swell, bigger than your water-retaining feet. Without this love, nothing could ever be well. A gift the heart wrapped early in this life. The more you give, the more you will have to cherish. If I could offer you my veins, I'd gladly use a knife. At times it seems if you go, I too will perish. A mould broke made a new mother of you. Blood, water, sealed with a kiss. All true. Beautiful. I love the way the, the there's a kind of peek through the poem of the rhyming words and that echoes what's happening in the poem. Oh, thank you. Did you find Imtiaz that writing uh, a sonnet form helped you um, when you were writing about loss? Do you find that having strict structures in a sense can give you more freedom as a writer, as a poet? In fact, a strange thing happened because after Simon died, I, I couldn't uh, write at all. I, what came out was kind of a scream. 
and, uh, and it wasn't really poems at all. It was too raw. And then there was a dream that I had about Simon coming back. And I tried and tried to write it and it just didn't work. It, it, I tried in different kinds of poems over the years and it just didn't happen. But it was when I came to trying to write a kind of a sonnet that uh, at last something about the form, the formality of it, allowed me to write the dream without it sounding over sentimental or maudlin. And that was the, the, the dream that appears in the trick with the, where he arrives with the oranges. Uh, and it was very much that, that the formality of it allowed me to write that poem. Yeah, you see, I find that really fascinating because it's such a beautiful poem, these oranges and his face having the, the light of the oranges in them. And there's so much that's radiant and resplendent in that. And it makes you think that when you're, when you lose somebody, you also, you also keep them very close, your subconscious hangs on to them, you know, they've gone, but they haven't necessarily gone far. And that you have to kind of, when you're, when you're grieving this, you have to learn to live alongside it and living alongside that grief can actually um, be also trying to remember how to do the things that you know to do. And so it's interesting you describing that sense of being able to return to poetry after this long, long scream. And that must've been a, surely a huge welcome relief for you to, to, to have that. Well, it was when I realized that I wasn't actually writing grief and loss, I was writing love. And I wasn't writing about death, I was writing about living and the kind of life we had and the kind of life this amazing person had. And in a way, those things carry on. I mean, it doesn't matter whether that was a personal thing I was writing about. I think we share those things, the feeling that, uh, that those things can continue that even whatever we believe or don't we believe, there still has to be a kind of belief that something persists. And whether you call it a presence or whatever it may be, and that's something that finds its way into the poems. And what I love as well is that when I read the poems to, you know, in crowded places, in all kinds of places, those people get to know this person that I love. Yeah, that's that's lovely and, and so true. And the, the other thing I find extraordinary about your poems about grief is there's often an unexpected humor in, in them. There's a, there's a dark humor there, which is so welcome because one of the things that we actually do when we're, we're grieving is, is laugh and it surprises us. It's perhaps a survival um, a technique, if you like, or survival skill. Laughter itself it allows us to say to ourselves that we are still alive. You know, um, I remember my mom saying to me, you know, when my dad died recently, Jackie, did you say to me that your dad died the day after my 89th birthday? And I said, yes, that's right, mum. And she said, well, he was always lousy at birthday presents, but he surpassed himself this time. And, and, and it, was, <laughs> it was the last thing I was expecting her to say. And it gave me such a, almost like a wave of relief. So I was just wondering what you think about that, if it has humour and grief. Exactly. Yeah. And, and in fact, that's what saves us a lot of the time. And that's part of life, as well. part of the life that you've lived has been the humor. I mean, I, I remember after uh, I, I was worrying about a gravestone and the fact that it was taking so long. And, you know, I was telling this to, to uh, my stepson, Simon's sons. And Daniel turned around and said, well, he's in no hurry, is he? <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely it's absolutely true well, i'd like to bring suzanne back at the moment because suzanne you're going to sing a song um for us that is special for mtas can you tell us a wee bit about why you've picked this particular song yes i was listening to mtas on the radio on desert island disc and when she was talking about simon and their journeys from wales to glasgow or to london and um, they loved Leonard Cohen and in particular this song, If It Be Your Will. So it's such a beautiful song. And I think, again, it captures, it's like a prayer, it's like a love song. It's got that kind of resonance. And um, I just thought it would be lovely to try and do for Intiaz in honour of her um, love and Simon and Poetry Live and all that still remains with us. Thank you, Suzanne. If it be your will. That I speak no more 
and my voice be still as it was before I will speak no more I shall abide unto I am spoken for if it be your will if it be your will that a voice is true from this broken hill I will sing to you From this broken hill, all your praises shall rejoice. If it be your will to let me sing from this broken. If it be your will to let me sing, if it be your will, if there is a choice, let the rivers fill. Let the hills rejoice. Let your mercy spill on every heart and hand. If it be your will to make us well. If it be a will, if it be a will, I will love you still until the end of time. Oh, that was so, so, so beautiful, Suzanne. Thank you so much. That felt like being given a great gift, didn't it, Mchaz? Exactly, yeah. Oh, that was just terribly, terribly, terribly moving. We're in bits here, Suzanne, what have you done to us? <laughs> but Suzanne, did, did you... Did you find that singing a Leonard Cohen song, I mean, a new song that you hadn't sung before, did you find the business of coming into a new song and learning it especially for somebody? How did you find that process? What was that like for you? It was difficult because um, I know that MTS likes another version as well. So I was trying to get that version because it's a fantastic version. It's the most gorgeous version um, by Anthony Hegarty. But I was trying to just find the truth and the soul of the kind of poem and the resonance of the writing. So I thought just try and take it in to make it your own. And I think what's really lovely is when you have someone to sing the song to. So that takes on a whole new meaning and purpose when you actually, when the guitar is there, I can sing the song <laughs> to her. But um, I think, and also it takes a while to tone in new material to get words that filter and flow and to really make your own but um, it's, it's a lovely new song for me to connect with you know and I look forward to it continuing to grow. Thank you. One of the wonderful things about um, this program Macker to Macker is that each of our three fantastic singers every week 
pick songs to go um, with the, the poet. So that we do have a genuine conversation, it seems, going between poetry and song and back and forth. And I think that's a, a truly lovely thing. It means that each singer is, is testing themselves every week, picking new new songs. And it's, you know, you were driving yourself around the twist, weren't you, Suzanne? Picking your songs <laughs> I was, yes, because it was a gorgeous uh, Nitin Sony song as well, um, that was, it was, I thought it would be really beautiful to do, but this just felt, I just, it just clicked, I thought, no, <laughs> this is the one, this is the, the feeling that's flowing through, it's that symbiotic relationship you have, isn't it, with um, the calling to either, if, like, recite a poem, or for me, sing a song, so, yeah, yeah. That's that's where I landed, <laughs> and, and it's fantastic, Suzanne, because it reminds me that actually in 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 the blues there's a call and response, and in and in this this program there's a kind of a call and response. You know, Imtiaz has called and and you've responded, yes. and we like that or we love that idea in the, in the program when we conceived of it really um, to to actually keep things moving back and forth between poetry and song, which leads me to you again, Imtiaz, and wondering if you can read for us your final wee set of poems. I want to say to Suzanne, you really made that your own. You made oh, that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Bless. Um, I read one called Hirayat, Old Bombay. Hirayat is one of those almost untranslatable Welsh words that mean something like a longing to return to something that's no longer there. And Bombay is a city whose name has been changed. I would have taken you to the Nas Cafe if it had not shut down. I would have taken you to the Nas Cafe for the best view and the worst food in town. We would have drunk flat beer and cream soda and sweated in plastic chairs at the Nas Cafe. We would have looked down over the dusty trees, at cars creeping along Marine Drive, round the bay to Eros Cinema and the talk of the town. We would have held hands in the Nas Cafe, over sticky rings on the tabletop, knee locked on knee at the Nas Cafe, while we admired the distant stock exchange, Taj Mahal Hotel, Sasundok, Gateway. We would have nursed a drink, at the Nas Cafe, and you would have stolen a kiss from me. We would have lingered in the Nas Cafe till the day slid off the map into the Arabian Sea. I would have taken you to Bombay if its name had not slid into the sea. I would have taken you to the place called Bombay if it were still there and if you were still here. I would have taken you to the Nas Cafe. So as Jackie was saying, uh, there's often uh, a lot of humor in, in uh, grief as well. And um, uh, also when it comes to writing love poems, you just use any language that comes to hand, you use any language you have. So that's just one more tool to use. So this one's called I Swear. Because I turned up from Bombay, too prissy to be rude. Because you arrived via Leeds and Burnley, you thought it would do me good to learn some language. So you never just fell, you went arse over tits. And you were never not bothered, you just couldn't be asked. And when you laughed, you laughed like an effing drain. And when there was pain, it was a pain in the arse. That was just the start, you taught me all the language you knew right through the alphabet from A to Z, from first to last, from bad to worse, and the very worst you could muster. I learned the curses, I learned the cursor. So proper you looked in your nice shoes and suit until you produced language like magic out of your mouth. And I was impressed. And oh, I fell for you, arse over tits. And when I said so, you laughed like a dream. And we blinded and swore like the daft buggers we were, all the way down Clerkenwell and all the way up on the train to the horseshoe pass. And I tell you, since you went, it's a pain in the arse. 
And when some days I feel like shit, or when I say that I feel flat, I swear, I hear you laugh like a dream. Not just flat, missus, flat as a witch's tit. That's what you say, flat as a witch's tit. Um, the last one I'll read is about the situation we're in now. And I wouldn't normally write into events that are still happening uh, because there's a danger of it being too raw, especially if, uh, especially, you know, close feelings, feelings that are felt too recently. But I think this is an exception because from March to now, things have been changing every day and we can never, could never, if we tried later, we couldn't bring back the immediacy or the uncertainties of the time uh, the, with the, the feelings that we're going through now. So I think it's fine if the writing is raw and because this is poetry talking to now, listening to the world now and saying what the world hasn't found a way to express yet. Cranes lean in. Cranes lean in waiting for an all clear that will not come. Forehead pressed to glass, phone at my ear, I learn to sail on your voice over a sadness of building sites, past King's Cross, St Pancras, to the place where you are. You say nothing is too far. Mothers will find their daughters. Strangers will be neighbours. Even saviours will have names. You are all flame in a red dress. Petals brush my face. You say at last the cherry blossom has arrived, as if that is what we were really waiting for. Oh, that was beautiful, Imtiaz. Thank you so much for all of these poems. They've given us um, such a lot of solace and, and comfort, actually nourishment. It seems to me that in these times when we're having to build up our immune system in all sorts of different ways, that building up our mental immune system is just as important as building up our physical one. And so listening to you tonight, Imtiaz Darker, and listening to you tonight, Suzanne Bonner has done, gone a great way to building up my mental immune system. It feels like proper nourishment and I feel properly fed by both of you. So thank you very much for joining us on Macker to Macker. Imtiaz, I'd love you to announce right now who is going to be next week's Macker. Well, there are two Mackers next week. One is the wonderful Gaelic poet Meg Bateman, who uh, come, will come to you from Sky, and Michael Pedersen, whose performances are a kind of roller coaster treat that you could look forward to. That's fantastic. And on Macker to Macker, every week the Macker picks a favourite bookshop. And I'm just wondering if you can tell us what your favourite bookshop is, MTS. Mine is the New York Bookshop in East London because it's a great independent bookshop. It's been working for over 40 years in East London and they're a treasure. Whenever there's a poetry event, uh, in London, and I see the newer bookshop there, I know that we're in great hands. That's great. Actually, the last event that I did in London, it was the new bookshop that were that were there, and it was just fantastic to see them all again. There's something that, that makes lifts your soul uh, with the great independent bookshop, and they are really a fantastic one. I'd like to, to thank you both very, very much, Suzanne Bonner, MTS Darker, for joining us on our fourth edition of Macker to Macker. I'd like to say a huge big thank you to our funders, who have made this possible. Firstly, to the National Theatre of Scotland, who have not only funded this, but are hosting this with the wonderful Ewan working behind the scenes. Thank you, thank you to Ewan. And, and I'd like to say thank you very much to Edinburgh International Book Festival, to Home Manchester, and to the School of Arts and Media in Salford. They all have supported us so as we could help get the poets and the singers paid. And in these times when artists are not, getting money from the government and falling between the cracks, that seemed ever more important. I'm Jackie Kay, as I said earlier, I'm your third modern macker, and I'd love you.
uh, to come and join us next week on another edition of Macker to Macker. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.